Sharda Shakti focuses on social, intellectual, cultural, and economical empowerment of women. And this is achieved through various workshops, lectures, exhibitions regarding the subjects. We have conducted professional women's conference in 2010, we meet, and national conference on women health in 2014. Recently, we have carried out one survey on post-COVID mental, physical, and social effects on married women, and it is appreciated by renowned persons in the society. Vidyan Katta is our monthly interactive activity based on current science. The purpose of this activity is to create science and technology awareness, introduction of emerging areas of science and technology and uh, through society and to science aspirants. Vidyan Katta under this activity, we conduct various programs like eco-friendly Ganpati festival decoration competitions and uh, during Ganpati festival and we get great response for this activity. We celebrate Science Day, International Yoga Day every year. Last year, we felicitated three Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Award winner women, and it was a great ceremony conducted by us. Shakti Sthapana Divas is on 21st March, and on this occasion, Shakti Prerana Puraskar is given to a woman who contributes significantly for social causes through scientific activities. Similarly, I Shakti Puraskar is given to a student who is needy and has developed interest in science. In our organization, we have doctors, engineers, professors, researchers, architectures, and housewives also, and those who are willing to willing to uh, willing to contribute for the social. Vandana mutes are less. Unmute, please. Don't know how. Okay. Audible. Last sentence, I will repeat again. I request you all to join us as a member of Shakti and contribute towards the social causes of society. Now, let us move to the main part of today's function. For this purpose, I request Mrs. Rudulkar Shirgurkar to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anuya Nisar. Over to you, Rudulkar. Good afternoon. It's my great to introduce our today's guest speaker, Dr. Anuya Nisar. She is the principal scientist in Polymer Science and Engineering Division at CSIR NCL. She has a PhD in chemical from IIT Mumbai and her master's in material science and engineering from University of Delaware, United States of America. Before joining NCL, she was working as a scientist in the GE Plastic John F. Wells Technology Center. At present, she is leading a group of scientists working in the area of polymers, biomaterials, medical devices, and tissue engineering at NCL. She has published 24 research papers in peer-reviewed journals and six patent families. She is working in collaboration with many industries for technology transfers. She has developed a technology wherein silk fibroin microparticles are used for scaffold for tissue regeneration. Based on this research, she has floated a startup, Serigen Mediproducts Private Limited, 
along with her colleagues at NCL. The products developed by this company are mainly useful for the patients who are suffering from severe injuries like bed sores, bone cancer, breast cancer, etc. This company has won ninth national award for technology innovation in polymers in public health care 2019-2020. It is also recipient of several awards, among which are Indian National Academy of Engineering, Young Entrepreneurs Award 2020, Leaders Innovation Fellowship from Royal Academy of Engineering, United Kingdom 2019, and a tie-back panel for women in entrepreneurship. Now, we are all would like to listen from Dr. Anya about her work, achievements, and experience while working as a scientist as well as entrepreneur, I'm sure many of us will get inspired with her work. Thank you, Dr. Anuya. Thank you, Shirgurkar, ma'am. I'll just share my screen. Yeah. Yeah, can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, thank Shirgurkar ma'am for giving me this opportunity to present our work here, for inviting me to uh, talk in this forum. Uh, I'd like to begin by congratulating Sharda Shakti for the amazing work that you're doing uh, for uh, in a very important area, women empowerment through science and technology. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to give a talk uh, in this forum. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, silk today. Uh, silk uh, is a material that uh, is used both in textiles and medical applications. Uh, as ma'am mentioned, I'm a scientist at the Polymer Science and Engineering Division at National Chemical Laboratory. Uh, so the way I structured my talk is I'll begin by telling you a little bit about silk. What, what do you mean by silk? What kind of material it is? And uh, then talk to you about what kind of research we have done both for textile as well as medical applications of silk. Uh, so we have a spin-off company from CSIR, which is called as Serigen Medi Products, uh, which is focusing on medical applications of silk. Uh, so towards the later part of my talk, I'll uh, focus uh, on that aspect. So uh, when we hear this word silk, what each one of us thinks is a royal, shiny, lustrous fabric. And this fabric has dominated the textile market for several centuries. Uh, it is even today, it remains to be the preferred material of choice for uh, all marriages and brides and grooms and so on, right? Uh, so, what exactly is silk? What is the definition of silk? So, silk, if you look at it scientifically, is a fibrous material which is secreted by more than 34,000 different species of spiders and more than 1 lakh different insects, okay? So, it's a very common term that encompasses all these uh, different insects. But why? what is common in all of this is that each of these spiders or insects have very specialized organs or glands in which they make the silk. The silk is then transported to an opening, which is called as the spinneret, through which the material comes out in the form of a fiber. And this then solidifies when it comes in contact with either air or some of the silks are also aquatic. So when it comes in contact with water, it would uh, solidify, right? So there are various uh, spiders who see, uh, secrete silk. So like I've shown here one and uh, different each spider also secretes different types of silk. So it's not that one, uh, one spider secretes one type of silk, but if you look at the spider web, the lines that go radially outwards and the lines that connect these radially outward are two different types of materials. So nature is very, very interesting. And today what we are going to talk about is the silkworm silk. Now the spider secretes this silk to either catch a prey or to escape itself from any um, or, uh, or, or uh, animal that is attacking it, the silkworm secretes a cocoon, which is basically for protection. So when the silkworm converts or metamorphosizes into a moth, it actually rests inside the cocoon. So it secretes it for protection. So different organisms or different insects and spiders secrete the silk for a variety of different reasons. 
Okay, so let's understand a little bit more about silkworm silk. Uh, why is this interesting to us? Because India is the second largest producer of silkworm silk. We produced more than 33,000 metric tons of silkworm silk in 2020-21. Uh, that's uh, China happens to be the first largest producer. Uh, we are the only country globally which can produce all four different types of silkworm silk. So we produce mulberry, tussar, eri, muga. And some of these will be familiar to the women because you buy a tussar silk sari or from Assam you have the muga silk sari. So mulberry silk is predominantly the silk that you find in Mysore or Chennai or most of the south states or even in Maharashtra now there is a huge cultivation of mulberry silk. Whereas Tassar, Eri, Muga are more dominant towards the northeastern states or the West Bengal or Assam and uh, those states are where you will typically see most of this. Now, mulberry silk is also a domesticated silk and I'll tell you more about that in the later slides. But Tassar, Eri and Muga are wild silkworms. So they feed on whatever is available in the nature. They eat a variety of different types of leaves. They also eat other different types of insects. And that is why these are called as wild silk. Uh, mulberry is now such a domesticated silkworm that if you leave it in the wild, it will not be able to survive. Uh, now, sericulture is a very, very mature industry in India, right? So just like agriculture, silk worm rearing is called as sericulture. Seri is a Latin word for silk, which means royal, lustrous, shiny, that, uh, those adjectives. Now, sericulture in India today employs more than 8.7 million people uh, in India. So it's a huge mature sericulture industry that India has. We have a central silk board which has been established, which has several laboratories across India. Uh, who, where the mandate is to do research on silk. They also do a lot of training programs for farmers. They work with farmers to maximize the production and the yield of silk. Uh, they teach the farmers about how to um, you know, uh, reduce the diseases in silk and how to get a maximum uh, yield. Now, uh, this is a picture that I'm sure each one of you recalls from your uh, school. So it, I've taken the picture from by Jews. But uh, basically here, what, what I'm trying to show you is the life cycle of the silkworm. So you can see that from these eggs, you have a small larva that comes out. This is like one to two mm in size, a very tiny creature, which feeds extensively on the leaves. So in case of mulberry, uh, this feeds only on mulberry leaves. In Marathi, it is called tuti chipana parmantotela. So uh, this silkworm eats the mulberry leaves and it grows to the size of this larva, which is, it's a very voracious eater. So it becomes about five to six centimeter long. So it's this huge uh, silkworm larva that you see. Now, once it has matured to this size, it will start secreting a cocoon uh, through a gland, which is present very close to the mouth of the silkworm. And from this opening, you'll see this continuous thread of silk, which is like four to five kilometers long. So each cocoon is made up of a thread, which is like, continuous and it's four to five kilometers long. So this larva spins this cocoon around itself and inside the cocoon, it converts into a pupa and then metamorphosizes into a moth. Each moth can then again lay 400 to 500 eggs and that is how the cycle continuously uh, goes on. Um, I'm just opening my pointer. Yeah, so this is how the life cycle of the uh, silkworm looks like. Okay, so I am going to talk mostly about this Bombyx mori silkworm or the mulberry silk because this silkworm feeds only on mulberry leaves. It is a very, very disciplined eater. So it has these um, sensory organs which allow it to sense mulberry leaves only as its feed. Anything else it will not eat. So it will die, but it will not eat anything else. Okay, it's very, very disciplined. And this is the kind of a cocoon that it secretes around itself. And if you look at the uh, cocoon, the cocoon, um, each individual thread of the cocoon, it looks like this over here. So from both the two sides of the mouth of the silkworm, you have this fibrous thing coming out, which is called as fibroin. And then there is a covering on the top of those fibers, which is called as sericin. 
So this sericin is a material that is like a glue. It is holding these silk threads together. And that is why the cocoon has its shape. Okay. Now sericin is soluble in water. And fibroin is the material which gives silk all its luster, its shine, its mechanical properties. Everything comes from this fibroin uh, protein. Uh, so for uh, some of the ladies to relate to, when we buy a raw silk sari, if you see the sari has a feel which is slightly stiffer, something like whether it is starched, it uh, feels that way. That is when sericin has not been removed from the silk thread. That is why it looks, appears a little bit uh, thicker and uh, slightly rough. But when you remove all the sericin, you will get a very shiny fabric which has a very nice fall to it and that is the property that comes from this fibroin protein. Now in our lab we mainly work with this fibroin protein although we also have some work on the sericin but I'm going to talk today mostly about our work with uh, fibroin protein. Okay a slightly uh, technical slide so uh, if you don't understand it's fine but I'll just tell you a little bit that this material or fibroin is actually a protein. It is a huge chain of amino acids that actually link together. There are 5,200 amino acids that connect together to form this long chain of the protein. And the pro uh, amino acids have a very repeat sequence like glycine, then you have alanine, then you again have glycine, alanine, glycine, serine. Now, because of this repeat sequence, this protein can very nicely form crystalline sheets. And that gives silk its excellent mechanical properties. Okay. Now, in addition to that, it has these amorphous regions that are present in the middle. And these amorphous regions along with the crystalline regions give silk a very interesting property, which is it has very, it is very strong. So if you compare the only synthetic fiber that comes very close in strength to silk is the Kevlar fiber, which is 3.6 kilopascal in modulus. But you cannot have an elongation. So you can't stretch that Kevlar fiber, but silk can also be stretched. So just like you can stretch a rubber band, you can stretch silk about 15%. So this balance of mechanical properties that you achieve, none of the synthetic fibers have been able to achieve even today. So this is an excellent material, you know, and uh, we know we've all seen the Spider-Man movies, right? So where spider silk is actually even stronger than silkworm silk. So this modulus is even higher than the silkworm silk. And that is why the Spider-Man can actually hang with the thread and jump from one building to other. But that's not possible with, um, uh, that's possible only because of this excellent mechanical strength that it has. Um, so this is a very, very broad introduction about what the silk material is. We understand that it is a protein. We take it, we are taking it mainly from the silkworm silk. Uh, we don't work so much with the spider silk because in spider silk, there is a lot of variation. The spiders are cannibalistic. They also, which means that they also eat each other. They eat anything that is available. So culturing spiders and getting good quality of spider silk is not possible. Whereas this Bombyx mori silkworm is extremely domesticated. So getting large quantities of silk in very good quality is not a problem for us. And that is the reason we chose to work with uh, silkworm silk. So I'll talk to you about a very interesting work for textile applications that we did in collaboration with uh, Central Sericultural Research Institute. Uh, now dyeing of textiles. So we all like silk saris in different colors, right? So the cocoon that the silkworm produces is typically white. In some uh, uh, varieties, you'll get it in slightly yellowish color or beige color when it is muga silk. But mostly these are the standard colors of silk that you get. Now you want it to be colored into all these bright maroon, green, blue shades so that you can uh, flaunt your silk saris, right? So Dyeing of textiles is considered to be the most polluting industry in the world. Okay, And uh, this is a very recent report from CNN, which I've just shown you some pictures about how it pollutes the water. Firstly, it needs a large amount of water. And this water is then goes into the rivers and it pollutes the river and the aqueous environment. Therefore, the, the scientist, Dr. Kanika Trivedi at uh, Central Sericultural Research and Training Institute in Mysore, 
uh, we collaborated with her in 2013-14. So she came up with this very, very interesting idea. What she did was, we know that these silkworms are only going to feed on these mulberry leaves and then they produce this white colored cocoon. What she did is she sprayed a pink colored solution on these leaves. And uh, this is a dye called as rhodamine B dye, which is the pink color. And what she saw is that when the silkworm eats these dye molecules along with the leaves, you actually get a pink cocoon. What that means is that you don't have to dye the silkworm silk after you get it. And you can directly use this cocoon to make the silk sari. So the dyeing process, which is causing so much of pollution is actually eliminated in this. And very interestingly, when she was looking at this, what happens is this is the mouth of the silkworm. So you're giving it the mulberry leaf along with the uh, dye molecule. Now this elementary canal, as you call, is lined by a membrane. And this dye molecule has to move out from the elementary canal into the blood of the silkworm. So the silkworm organs are actually suspended in this blood or pool of blood that is present around. And from here, they have to go into the silk gland. And then what you get is the colored silkworm cocoon. So she showed that if I feed the silkworms with a small concentration, I get a light pink color. If I feed it with a higher concentration of dye, I get a dark pink color. So essentially you can achieve all the different shades, you know, so she can feed the silkworms for only one day with dye, you get a light pink, she can feed it for all four or five days with the color and you can get dark pink and so on. So she tried to do this with a variety of different dye molecules. Uh, so she was using all the food grade dyes that are used. But what she saw is that some dyes actually color it while others don't. And that is when she came and approached NCL to understand how the dye chemical structure actually relates to, um, you know, getting a colored silk cocoon. So we did a very interesting work here. And what we saw is that if you have a large dye molecule, which has molecular weights very high, then that molecule cannot actually transmit from the elementary canal into the blood and give you a colored cocoon. So it is uh, like a filter, you know, it, uh, it actually filters out all the dye and only the mulberry, uh, this goes into the blood. And therefore, when you go to smaller molecules, they can actually start going into the silkworm gland. I'm showing you some pictures over here of the gland becoming nicely colored. And then you get this colored cocoon. And we also then said that if you have a very hydrophobic dye, which means that if the dye does not like water at all, again, then you will not get a colored cocoon. So we had different studies to show that how you can actually uh, change the molecular structure of the dye to get this uh, color. And this was very interesting scientifically. So I did this study with my colleague, Dr. Sayam Sen Gupta at NCL. Uh, and uh, this was uh, very well appreciated in the literature. Uh, interestingly, CSRTI also licensed this technology for pink silk to R RMKV silk, which is a very famous silk in the Chennai uh, region. And they are actually selling these green silk saris, they call it, uh, which is less pollution causing uh, dyes into the market. So uh, this was about a textile application and how you can actually use science and technology to reduce the pollution that is caused. But silk has another very interesting aspect to it, which is a medical aspect. Now, we are not the first to think about this. Silk-based sutures to stitch wounds have been there for hundreds of years. It is, uh, there are reports about it in our ancient literature. And more than 100 years ago, in 1887, Johnson & Johnson, which is a company that I'm sure all of you have used bandages from, right? So J&J produced this sterile sutures made out of silk. And this was used in surgeries right from 1887. Today, if you look at, there are several companies in India who make silk-based sutures that can be used to stitch the wounds. There are companies globally also who are making silk-based sutures. And they form a huge... Uh, uh, I mean, they are one of the important products in the portfolio of many, many large companies um, globally. Now, if you take this silk, uh, we spoke about how it has a very good mechanical property, like it is very strong, but it also has very good chemical properties, right? So if you take your silk sari and if you get drenched in the rain, if you get wet, your sari does not dissolve in water, it stays, right? 
you can also dry clean your silk which means oh. that if i use any chemicals organic solvents with the silk it does not harm the silk in any way so imagine the cocoon is produced to protect the silkworm moth inside and the material is such that even if you have an acid rain it will not cause any damage to the moth inside so it's actually really really strong and protecting the moth when it's inside the cocoon now because this silkworm thread is water insoluble when you put it in your body let's say uh, it's used typically for uh, surgeries in where you need to suture inside the body so like your abdomen or stomach or that regions is where silk threads are used so the thread by itself cannot dissolve in water but there are some enzymes that are present in our body and these enzymes can actually break these amide bonds that are present in the silk and therefore when you put silk inside into your body first you will see that nothing happens to it then you will see that there are a lot of inflammatory cells that come around the silk so this is a typical response from your body cells that you will see and eventually over a period of say 6 months or so you will see that the silk starts actually breaking into small pieces so it's not harmful it is safe to be put inside into the body and over 2 years you will see that silk is not there at that implantation site so it has been completely absorbed by your body this being a protein your body actually knows how to deal with this right so in terms of medical it is called as a biocompatible material which means that it is safe and it is not toxic to your body when implanted in the body now what has changed in the last 20 25 years is that this silk thread so researchers have figured out a protocol to convert this silk thread into a solution now i first told you that silk is actually insoluble in water it cannot dissolve in water but in our lab we now have a protocol by which we can convert this silk fiber into a solution and this solution can be converted into different forms so we can now make this silk film which is very nice and transparent we have made these nano fibers out of silk which then were decorated with gold nanoparticles or other functional molecules we have made coatings out of silk nano coatings out of that we have also worked with uh, dr prabune who is here in the audience to show that it can be used with biosurfactants to form these very interesting hydrogels of silk so um, now that we can convert the silk solution into all these different forms it opens up a lot more medical applications than just use of this thread to suture the wounds right and that has been the focus of our research that this conversion into different forms is being leveraged so very quickly let me tell you um, one aspect of um, tissue regeneration or regenerative medicine or tissue engineering so these words are used interchangeably uh, let's say you have an organ in the body which is not working so there is a failure of a liver or um, uh, any organ and we typically hear that there is a transplant from a cadaver or a, a for another person who has donated an organ and that is then implanted into the patient's body and the patient recovers right and we frequently read about how there is a huge waiting time for receiving a donor to actually be able to get that matched with the patient's blood and all of those factors have to come together and only then can you um, do this transplantation but in biomaterials what we try to do is we make a scaffold or a material that can be implanted in the patient's body let's say it is a liver that is not functional if i can put in the scaffold inside into the patient's body then the neighboring cells from the liver actually migrate on to the scaffold and they start making this new scaffold so you help to repair this organ and eventually you have a repaired organ that is done now we are trying to make silk in this form so that the silk can go inside into your body it can help the cells to actually start repairing whatever is the damage over there and eventually get you to a functional organ that is present right so based on these concepts the um, 
medical applications of silk, we started this company, Serigen, in 2015. I did this with my colleagues, Dr. Premnath and Dr. Ashish Lele, who are also the founders of this startup. So at Serigen, what we do is we take natural silk proteins and we convert them into medical implants, which can be used for tissue regeneration. So I'll tell you a little bit about our flagship product. Now, uh, imagine that you have a cavity in the bone. A cavity in the bone can be formed because of an accident. So when you have a very um, severe accident, the material uh, that is uh, used to plug in, uh, basically when you have a very severe accident, the bone over there sometimes results in the formation of a powder. So it's a large cavity that is formed. So in addition to these steel bars, the surgeon needs something to fill it into this cavity so that it can help in healing of this fracture. You also have bone cancer patients. You have patients who are suffering from an infection in the bone. And these cavities can be as large as three to five centimeter in size, right? So when an orthopedic surgeon needs to fill up this cavity, he looks for a material that can be used inside over here. This material should be obviously safe. It should be biocompatible. It should allow these neighboring cells to actually start growing, proliferating, and form a new bone eventually, which will not result in any fracture, right? So that is what our product does. We have a product called a serios, which can be implanted into the bone of the patient. So we have it in the form of a powder. The surgeon can use it like this. We make these small kinds of pellets, which can be used to fill in the cavities. Or we also make different shapes or blocks in the form of a wedge, a cylinder, or a cube. And we also make it in the form of a putty so that the surgeon can actually press and fit it into this cavity. And what we have shown so far is that compared to all the leading global products that are available in the market, so these are the materials that the orthopedic surgeons today use. We are at least two times better in terms of all bone repair parameters. So this is ALP is a marker that we have looked at and which is at least two times higher than all these current materials that are used, right? So when you think of it in terms of um, repeat fractures or post-surgical complications that are there in a patient, we have seen that in an animal model for serios there were none. So there was no repeat fracture and whereas this leading material that is used today, at least 50% of the animals had a fracture in their bone because of not having good properties of this material stimulant. So um, just like you have fractures in the bone, we also need materials that can be used for other soft tissue regeneration. So we have two other products, Serimat. Serimat is being used for breast cancer patients where uh, when you remove the cancerous tissue and you want to reconstruct the shape and size of the breast, this mat can actually be used to support the breast implant or the silicone implant that is used. And uh, we also have a product called a Seriderm, which is a wound dressing. It is non-adherent, which means it does not stick. So let's say if you have a cotton gauge and you dress a wound with cotton gauge, what happens is that the exudate that is coming out from the wound it is absorbed in the cotton, but the cotton also sticks to the wound. So when you have to dress, the, for the patient, it is very, very painful. It also interferes with the healing of the wound. So our wound dressing is actually non-adherent. It does not stick, but it still absorbs all the exudate that comes out. And we have data to show that it accelerates the uh, wound healing significantly. Now, um, when you develop such medical products, uh, the path for taking these medical products to the market is typically very long. So you start with research in your lab where you develop new quality biomaterials, you develop new materials using uh, good material science, chemistry, physics, biology techniques. And then when you convert it, you design it to develop it into a medical device. You then do testing in animals to show that and in your lab to show that it is actually safe and it is not toxic. So for all our three products, we have done uh, testing in the uh, uh, animal models and we have shown that it is safe, it is not toxic and can be used. And then you do what is called as a clinical trial. 
So because of the vaccine, a lot of people have now heard about what is a clinical trial. But basically, government has now given us permissions to use Serios and Serimat in patients. So we are actually recruiting patients to do some of the trials, use this material in the patient body and see whether what we've seen in the animal model is actually happening inside in the patient's body as well. And after this, we will get our final approval for sales. For Ceriderm, we are very close to, we have set up our own manufacturing facility. And in early 2022, we will launch this wound dressing uh, in uh, the market. So um, basically that is what I had. I would like to summarize by saying that uh, silk is a protein molecule. It is a natural material that is secreted by the silkworm. And uh, it has very, very diverse applications ranging from traditional textiles to something as state of the art as uh, tissue engineering. A lot of people to thank, although I'm presenting this work uh, here today, we have a very uh, excellent team here at NCL, also at Serigen, who has uh, worked hard to bring the products to this stage. I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Ashish Lele, who, has, uh, who is currently the director of CSIR National Chemical Laboratory. He's also my PhD advisor. Um, he has also been my mentor throughout my career. Uh, he was the person who pioneered the silk-based work at uh, NCL. And uh, I have learned immensely through my interactions with him. Uh, Dr. Premnath, who is also a co-founder at Serigen, uh, he is uh, also an inventor on the patent for the silk-based bone product. And he has taught me the nuts and bolts about uh, taking deep tech scientific products into the market. So scientific entrepreneurship is something that I've learned from him. Uh, he's also a scientist at NCL, and he's also the founder of Venture Center, uh, which is a technology business incubator uh, at NCL, which supports deep technologies to be converted into uh, products. Uh, I've actually been fortunate to have very sincere and um, immensely hardworking students uh, who have uh, developed all these ideas and have helped in taking them to the market. Uh, the team at Serigen, uh, where, uh, which is led by Dr. Swati Shukla, and um, they have worked really hard for taking the idea stage product towards commercialization, so bringing it right up to clinical trial stage. Um, also, my collaborators, Dr. Kanika Trivedi, who is uh, now retired from CSRT and Mesur, where we did the color silk work with her. And uh, Dr. Sayam from NCL, who is now at ISER Kolkata, was also part of uh, this color silk work that I presented. Uh, a lot of uh, people to acknowledge for the funding that we have uh, received. Uh, NCL initially supported um, the funding through some internal funding we have received uh, from NCL. Venture Center also provided us initial proof of concept funding, and we have been incubated at Venture Center before we set up our own facility uh, for the Serigen. Uh, BIRAC, which is Department of Biotechnology's uh, funding arm, who has immensely funded uh, our products right from idea stage, and we continue to uh, get funding from them. So uh, without their support, it would not have possible to come to this uh, stage. Once again, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thanks to all of you for listening to me very patiently. And I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anuya Nisha, madam. Uh, really, you took us to the amazing world of silk in a very simple and uh, very easy to understand way. Uh, okay. Now we'll have some question answers. I request uh, Ms. Dr. Manisha Khrastar, Madam, to conduct this session. Good evening, all. Uh, I would like to ask Anuya, Ma'am, two questions. Sure. One is, can you elaborate a little bit on the journey from taking out silk from the womb to making actually silk which can be used? medicinal application. Okay. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the cocoon, what happens is when the silkworm is produced, the cocoon, typically if you just let it stay, it will convert into a moth and then the moth flies away. 
but a silkworm farmer will actually uh, at the right stage take the cocoon and put it into hot water which by which it, he can get this continuous thread of silk now that is what we buy from the silk farmer uh since silk has been used for medical applications like sutures the farmers are very very aware and conscious about the um uh, you know how you can uh, really maintain the quality of the silk and uh, we have two at least two or three different farmers through whom we have been buying that silk thread so in our lab we start with the silk thread from the farmer and then we have our own patented protocols by which we convert it into the solution and then from the solution into these different forms which go for different applications how difficult it was to convince people that this silk can be used for medicinal applications means from lab to the market how was the journey yeah um so like i said silk uh, being a material that has been used in medical applications uh all throughout like the thread is something that was already being used for hundreds of years so when you talk to doctors they do realize that yeah i have used a silk thread for stitching the wounds and uh for suture applications uh for them it was very difficult to believe that this is the when i showed that silk block they for them it is very difficult to believe that this is only silk so how do you convert that soft silk thread into something that is now as hard as bone right so uh, that that was uh, difficult to convince having said that i think um, we have met some really um, early adopters i would say of technology people who are curious and anxious and really want to make a difference and are willing to support these kinds of activities so we have uh, we are conducting our clinical trials at multiple hospitals in pune we have leading orthopedic surgeons who have come mm-hmm. on board to lead the clinical trials they are excited about what we have seen in the animal model and they really want to come and work with us and take these products to the market so um, for the clinical trial stage at least i think uh, initially it was difficult because uh, silk has never been put in bone uh, we are the world's first company to actually say that silk can go in bone and uh, therefore there is some resistance that we face but we are fortunate to have met some right people who have supported us immensely in this effort when this filling is actually taking place filling like a cement going into a gap and filling the gap uh does it mold really well do you require a specific uh, fluidity or consistency or density yeah so um there are different applications in which you would need the fluidity and consistency for us the kind of uh, large cavities that we are looking at what we need is that that silk material should only be a little in touch with the neighboring bone so mm-hmm. that the cells from the neighboring bone can come inside into the silk so the material that we have is porous so that those large pores allow these cells to come inside once the cells like the material they actually attach on to that they start secreting the natural bone and two years down the line we expect that you will not see silk in the bone at all but a natural new bone that is actually very nicely formed uh, in that place right. that was really very interesting information anybody who wants to ask anything can now uh, ask yes because i don't see any questions in the chat box as such i would like to ask uh, dr anuya uh, about the dressing material which she has developed through her company mm-hmm. uh, is it available in market now and uh, do we need any expert in using this material or a layman can use it just like a banded strip which we get in the market yeah uh so uh, we are awaiting the final approval for manufacturing and sales for the wound dressing uh, application uh, we should have it any time soon but uh, we will start selling in january 2022 so early 2022 is our target for uh, selling sedidum in the market um your second part of the question is basically will it be available over the counter uh, not really this is a very uh, this is a dressing that is going to be used for advanced wound care it is not uh, recommended to use something like this for a simple cut or a, a slight uh, 
wound that a child would have when you fall or something like that. But it is going to be very useful for diabetic uh, uh, wounds, uh, which are generally dressed by specialized surgeons, diabetic foot ulcers, uh, bed sores, or uh, some wounds like second degree burns, which actually have a large amount of exudate that comes out of the wound. And there is where you need these specialized kinds of dressings. So it will not be available over the counter, uh, but it will be av available with the hospitals. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to ask a very basic question. Uh, yes. Is this uh, strength of the silk is uh, better than cotton? is one question and second uh, do we need sterilization hmm. whenever using for the medical applications yeah yeah very good questions um silk yes it is uh, one of the strongest threads that you will get and uh, like i mentioned the balance of elasticity and strength is something that differentiates silk from all these other uh, natural threads that you have um your second aspect question was about sterilization which is absolutely important for any medical application. So all our three products are actually sterilized. Uh, we work with ETO kind of uh, sterilization. We have a vendor with whom we have standardized our protocols for sterilization. Um, silk, interestingly, is a very stable material. So you can also do steam sterilization. You can actually put it in the uh, cooker, pressure cooker, and nothing will happen to it. It's a very um, stable material that way. But for us, we are going with ETO sterilization for our Seridum product. For Serios and Serimat, we are going with steam sterilization. Is it suitable to be used for old age patients? Um, old age uh, patients, any specific uh, disease condition, or uh, you're just saying for geriatric? Uh, population in general. Uh, Mrs. Meena, can you elaborate on this as it's your question? Old age Rugnan Sati Vaparta Yenka, Tiaasa Vicharta, Kahi specific disease Australia Rugnan Sati, ki in general old age Rugnan Sati Vaparta. So osteoporosis is one common uh, problem which leads to fracture in bones for a large amount of women in India, especially and in developing countries, you will see that uh, one in three women actually suffer from osteoporosis. And uh, for osteoporosis patients, formation of the bone is actually very uh, poor as you age and that ability to form new bone also continuously decreases. The bone density is very poor. And serios being a material that can stay in your body for longer time compared to what the current materials are uh, and, the, uh, and its ability to actually form two times better quality uh, bone compared to some of these materials. We definitely feel that it will be a very nice application for osteoporotic patients. And uh, although our current clinical trial is not focused on that, but in the future, we do intend to uh, use it for osteoporosis kind of uh, this. Directly uh, 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 but if there is a cavity or a fracture that happens because of that, that is where you can uh, use serios. Another question is, is it cost effective? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, for Seridum, yes, definitely we can uh, match the pricing of all the competitive products that are in the market. Uh, and if not, uh, you know, at the same price, we are giving you much more value from what we see in our animal patients. Uh, we have not decided on the final cost of our, this. The pricing strategy is yet to be um, evolved uh, by the company, but it will definitely be cost effective. I think all the uh, one more question from me. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Uh, yeah, you you told that the dye that dye to get the color thread that mm -hmm. dye is sprayed on the mulberry leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, is it not harmful to other species spraying the dye on the mulberry leaves? Yeah. Or so, can we alternatively we can spray can we spray that dye on cocoon itself? Huh. So uh, basically what, what we do is for these um, mulberry silkworms, uh, they are completely domesticated. Okay, So they don't grow on the mulberry tree as we have seen in our um, textbooks. 
what is done in a silk farmers this is he'll have a very nice ac room where he'll maintain the temperature at 25 he will maintain the humidity and then he'll have these trays in which he will keep all the silkworms and the mulberry leaves are put inside in the tray so in that tray is where we are actually spreading these uh, yeah. uh, along with that we are spraying the silk uh, color so that other species are not affected so we actually pluck the mulberry leaves put them in the tray along with the silkworm and we spray the color over there and then the silkworms actually eat uh, the color along with the mulberry leaves okay uh, any other questions madam oh there are no questions in the chat box uh, i had said to some of our audience that in the end i'll give a quick summary in marathi so i'll do that because sure. there was there were questions like we are not able to understand so only for them i am giving a quick summary yeah or aplya na maiti asel kiwa nasel pan sel he 34000 big big species pasun jacha madhe koli kiwa spider ya class madle insects add karun total 113000 big big ya kitakan pasun sel milta एकाच प्रकारच्या कीटकांपासूनही वेगवेगळ्या प्रकारचं सिल्क मिळू शकत इंडिया भारत देश हा सेकंड लार्जेस्ट म्हणजे दुसरा सर्वात मोठा सिल्क प्रोड्युसर देश आहे आणि सिल्कच्या चार महत्वाच्या जाती मलबेरी कॅसर एरी आणि मोगा या पिया मलबेरी या जातीवर मॅडमनी एन सी एल मध्ये जास्तीत जास्त काम केलेलं आहे सिल्कच्या उद्योगामध्ये भारतात 8.7 मिलियन म्हणजे सत्याऐंशी लाख लोक साधारण या कामाशी जुळलेले आहेत किंवा ते करताय रॉ सिल्क मध्ये सेरिसेल हे रिमूव्ह केलेलं नसतं त्यामुळे त्याला थोडासा कडकपणा असतो ते रिमूव्ह केलं तर सिल्क एकदम सॉफ्ट होईल डाईंग म्हणजे रंग देणे सिल्कला ही सर्वात जास्त प्रदूषण करणारी इंडस्ट्री असल्यामुळे जर इनहेरंटली रेशमाला रंग देता आला तर तो जास्ती ऍक्सेप्टेबल होईल म्हणून त्यांनी जे प्रयोग केले त्याच्यामध्ये खाण्यासाठी कम्पॅटेबल म्हणजे जे खाता येतील असे रंग वापरून वेगवेगळे एक्सपेरिमेंट केले त्यात असं आढळून आलं की पिंक कलर येलो कलर जे आपण चित्रात बघितले ते चांगल्या प्रकारे असिमिलेट होतात पण सगळेच कलर असिमिलेट होतात असं नाही त्या प्राण्यालाही काहीतरी सिलेक्टिव्हिटी असली पाहिजे की ज्यामुळे काही पर्टिक्युलर कलरच येऊ शकतात आणि खूप हाय मॉलिक्युलर वेट असलेले जे डाय आहे ते असिमिलेट केले जात नाहीत कारण त्या प्राण्याची छोटीशी जी डायजेस्टिव्ह सिस्टीम असेल त्याच्यामधन ते पास होऊ शकत नाही त्यांच्या जास्ती मॉलिक्युलर वेळ मुळे अठराशे सत्याऐंशी साली पहिला रिपोर्ट सापडतो ज्याच्यामध्ये सिल्कचा वापर टाके घालण्यासाठी केलेला जो फायबर आहे धागा आहे त्याच्यामध्ये केला जातो आणि सिल्क हे प्रोटीन असल्यामुळे ते पटकन आपली शरीर ऍक्सेप्ट करत त्यामुळे जर सिल्क पासन थ्रेड तयार केला आणि तो कुठल्या रुग्णासाठी पेशंटसाठी वापरला तर बाहेरच पूर्णपणे आर्टिफिशियल एखादी गोष्ट धागा पॉलिमर सारखा वापरण्यापेक्षा सिल्क हा जास्ती पटकन आपलं शरीर ऍक्सेप्ट करू शकेल मॅडमनी दोन प्रकारचे सिल्कचे प्रॉडक्ट जे मेडिकल अप्लिकेशन साठी निर्माण केलेले आहेत त्याचा सेरीमॅट हा ब्रेस्ट कॅन्सर साठी वापरात येऊ शकतो आणि सेरी डर हा वुंड हिलिंग म्हणजे बर्न स्किन असेल तर त्यासाठी प्रायमरीली वापरता येतो आता असं आपल्याला दिसत की जवळ मार्केटच्या जवळ अप्रुवलच्या जवळ यांचं प्रॉडक्ट पोहोचलेलं आहे तर आम्ही त्यांना अशी शुभेच्छा देतो की तुमचं प्रॉडक्ट लवकरच मार्केटमध्ये येऊ दे आणि सगळ्या पेशंट्सना त्याचा उपयोग होऊ दे थँक्यू सो मच थँक्यू व्हेरी मच मॅम थँक्स थँक्यू मराठी थँक्यू
थैंक यू अपन सर्वानी हा कार्यक्रम लाभ घपस्थित आभार या बरोबरच आजचा आपल्या कार्यक्रमाची शेवट शांती मंत्राने होईल तर आपण सर्व शांती मंत्राने या प्रोग्रामचा एंड करूया शारदा शक्ती तर्फे पुन्हा डॉक्टर अनुया निसळ यांचे खूप खूप आभार सर्वे भवंतु सुखिन सर्वे संतु निरामया सर्वे भद्राणि भद्रा पश्यु शांति शांति